courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Calgary Flames are halfway through their training camp and down to 40. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to talk about the first half of the preseason. Matt, we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording, but isn't it weird that, you know, it's still preseason and it's almost the end of September. Like, it feels like the the season should be starting right away. Yeah, like I remember years ago where like it'd be like the first couple of days of October, not like the tenth of October, uh, that games would start happening. And yeah, it, it is a little weird, but it, you know the I think because of COVID, they've had to slowly dial back from, and the, I think that they're just not quite there yet for you know resetting everything. Well, let's talk about the last week of Flames games, shall we? Mm-hmm. The Flames opened the preseason on the 22nd um, in Seattle against the Kraken with a big 6-1 win. That was their first preseason game. And, you know, after that, we saw a lot of Flames fans excited. Wow, 6-1. Don't get used to this, folks. There's going to be weeks we don't even score six. Yeah, then Um, the very next day, uh, we did it twice. (laughs) That's that's right. Yeah, 18 (laughs) goals in, in 24 hours. Um, good, but good, anyway, good the, days to be a Flames fan, you know, you can rub it in the Oilers face a little bit. So that's right. Relish Always good. It. Yep. This first game against Seattle, um, Clark Bishop, Matt Coronado, Adam Klapka and Jeremy Poirier all scored uh, in the first. Then we had Poirier again in the second, Klapka and Ferk in the so Poirier in the second again, and then Klapka and Ferk in the third. So some multi-point nights, which is awesome. Nice to see Jeremy Poirier looking good. I wasn't sure what to expect after his injuries. He's he's looking like he's back to form. I mean, at least after that one game, it was, you know, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, but he didn't look like he was still battling anything. He looked like he was ready to go. No, he pretty much looked exactly how he did last year at training camp where he was a standout and, uh, hopefully he stays healthy and with the Wranglers uh, to start the year, and he'll be one of the players pushing for a job as soon as injuries or trades happen down the road. We both agree that he will be starting with the Wranglers, right? Yeah, there are just too many bodies currently. Um, you know, like guys like Mira Manov, Pahal, Bean. Barry potentially, Hanley potentially, like there are just too many guys in front of him where he's not outstanding enough to be like, okay, yeah, you're like a top pairing defenseman in the NHL right now, so we should throw you in. Yeah. He's not that yet. And so. like we talked about last week, he lost a year of devs, so you kind of want to, I think, start him down there too to to get that development year. Yeah, and the thing is, is that teams that tend to rush their prospects, that's why you see teams like Arizona and Buffalo be in the wilderness for a decade plus, because, you know, those guys get oversaturated early, they don't have time to adjust and, like, naturally progress, and having that time is important for all of the young players on the Flames. Always an exciting night for the split squad. The one in the game that was played in Calgary was a six to one win, and the one in Edmonton was a six to three win. So twelve goals, one night. Quite an exciting night. You and I were at the dome for this one, and we were looking at the Edmonton roster. It was crazy. Like the only guy of note was Mike Hoffman, the only guy who scored. Otherwise, it was a bunch of no name guys. Yeah, and you can tell when a team has no prospects at all because, like, the Flames basically just controlled the game the entirety of the 60 minutes like the one goal was on the power play and like other than the first five minutes where everybody was just kind of getting their legs under them it was kind of even at that point but after that it was all calgary all night and yeah and that was one thing you and i noted was this was the first game for a lot of the veterans and the first period looked kind of sluggish but once they picked it up and got going calgary is all over them yeah, it literally looked like the Flames versus the Hitman level of domination. It was like the, uh, the Oilers only had two shots in the third period, and yeah, like it was not a very good performance by their prospects. No, it wasn't. Uyghur got a goal. Uh, Zari got two. Mirmanov got one, and Chernigovich got two. So you know, goals I guess from the guys you'd expect in this one. Again, the Oilers' uh, goaltender was Rodrigan Day. I've never even heard of Day. So, you know, guy who 
like you said, kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel for prospects there. And we flip over to the game in Edmonton. Edmonton had some heavier hitters in that game. Um, some of their top guys, I mean, if we looked, they had Hyman, they had Dreisaitl, they had uh, Perry, McDavid. Hopkins, McDavid. So they, they had some some bigger names there. Still not the best goaltending. Yeah, it was more or less. Yeah, it was more or less their NHL lineup except for the goaltending, which was Picard and uh, Brochu. And in that game, the Flames got goals from Kuznetsov, Mantha, Anderson, Coronado, who got two, and Justin Kirkland, a name that you don't see too often on a Flames score sheet. Yes, Kirkland's best. There you go, Kirkland's signature. Um, I guess you could probably get that on a hockey card. Technically, Kirkland's signature. Yep. But yeah, it was uh, it was a good night to be a Flames fan. I can't I can't think of the last time we had twelve goals in a night. Yes, it, it was a good game, and in Both Calgary, good and yes, and uh, Devin Cooley was the standout for the Flames in uh, Edmonton. He, the Oilers managed forty seven shots in that game, and uh, Cooley only allowed three goals and. Uh, the thing that uh, got me in that Oilers game is that, like, McDavid, Bouchard, and Dreisaitl played, like, 28 minutes a night in that game. And it's like, dude, it's preseason. Like, you don't need to, you know, like, and it's that, like the Oilers' first game in preseason. You don't need to abuse those guys right off the hop. Like, the game doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, fans probably expect to see some of those names, but I'm kind of surprised that they were all dressed. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. You talked about Cooley in Edmonton. We also saw Vladar play here in town. He played 40 of the 60 minutes. And, you know, again, hard to evaluate after one game here, but I did not see him looking like he was lagging after any of his injuries. No, uh, he, even in the game, subsequent game against Vancouver, he looked perfectly normal like he did last year. Like there was no hiccup or hang up that would say oh this guy's just coming off an injury which is good i mean as we've talked about we need goalies this year and i'm glad to see that vladar looks like he's ready to go yeah and i must say that i've been very impressed with uh cooley's performance and he's looked good he, he looks like he you know if the flames for whatever reason wanted to start wolf in the ahl he would be perfectly fine as an nhl goaltender in his own right um not that you would start Wolf in the A, but you know, the, the theoretically that yeah, or you know, when and if there's would... an injury, you feel comfortable with him stepping in. Exactly. The next game was on uh, the 25th. They call this a neutral site game, which I still kind of laugh at. It was in Abbotsford, not really a neutral site, but yeah, not... it's like oh, it's just outside of Vancouver. Yes, yeah, not neutral. the not the Canucks home <laughs> rink, but still very much. I mean, that's where their American League team plays. So yeah, yeah. not not a neutral site by my definition of neutral site, but either way, um, this was a, a 4-3 Vancouver win in overtime. So the the Flames dropped this one, their first loss of the preseason. And, you know, again, I think the biggest story for me here was the goaltending. Cooley and Wolf split the duties. Both of them looked really good here. You saw a younger Flames lineup in this. I mean, we had Morton, we had Zari, we had uh, Gridin. Kirkland, Dewar, Pospisil, so you know, very much. Yeah, a younger it was very team. scarce with uh, veteran NHLer guys in the lineup, yeah. which makes sense. And the fact that it went to overtime against pretty much Vancouver's opening day roster, you know, like the hustle that all of those guys had um, shows well for them, and it'll be interesting to see like once they get the experience exactly where the, these players develop into it will be for sure and then the flames played the canucks again uh at home we should have done a neutral site and played in airdrie or something but uh yes or okotoks yeah there, there you go we don't have the building for that so we played in i guess technically we went from their hl arena to our nhl our hl arena so no. Okay, sure. Um back <laughs> in back in the dome on Saturday night, the Flames win four to two over the Canucks. Um this one was Pakal, Lomberg, Coleman, and Klapka scoring for the Flames in the four two win of a uh, more veteran looking lineup. I mean, I think you're starting to see the Flames getting to close to what their opening day lineups are gonna be now, and we'll see that again on Monday. We'll talk about that one. But um Cooley and Vladar splitting time and net in this. This to me 
looked like, okay, I can see this team and these guys and, you know, on the roster and the flames, I think we're just trying to get pairings and chemistry going pairing line, the chemistry. Yeah. It looked more like a regular season game and the chippy and feistiness, uh, especially in the third period, uh, made the game a lot more fun and interesting. Um, like it, it started off being more of a, like a pedestrian preseason game, but then like as hits started getting delivered by namely Klapka, um, that you know things started getting a little out of hand in the third period and it was nice to see some emotion in the game um from two teams that generally don't like each other anyway so uh we'll see uh, how that carries over to the regular season but like the flames having an identity of uh you know don't mess with us and like we will hit you um is a good thing and I have to say I'm very impressed by the work of Adam Klapka in all of the preseason games, but especially that game. Well, let's against let's hold that thought. We'll come back to that idea. Of yeah. Who we like and who we don't. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, I mean Klapka has been great. Again, we'll come back to talking about him, but let's uh, let's talk about some of the guys that aren't here after that. The Flames have trimmed their roster down to 40 now, as of. Uh, as of Saturday. So there's players going to the American League. The American League training camp actually starts Monday the 30th, so they need guys down there. But essentially, on the goaltending side, Connor Murphy and Matt Radomski have been assigned to the Wranglers. Um, on the back end, Axel Hertig, Eric Jamison, Henry Muse, and Etan Moran have been returned to their junior teams, as well as uh, Parekh going back to his junior team. And Yoni Yermo, Jeremy Poirier both sent down to the Wranglers. On the forward side, Jacob Bataglia, Hunter Lang, Luke Misa were all assigned to their junior team on the 24th. Luke McNamara, who you liked, was uh, sent back to his junior team on the 24th as well. Um, Alex Basha, Matvey Gridden were assigned to their junior teams on the 26th. And then Gallant, Trevor Janke, Rory Cairns, Ilya Nikolaev, David Silkey, Parker Bell, Lucas Siona, Le- Jaron Lipinski, and William Stromgren all signed to the Wranglers. So that gives the Flames 40 guys left, essentially four goalies, 14 uh, defensemen, and 22 forwards. None of those guys surprised me when I heard they were re- re- either sent down or, uh, I guess, sent to the HL or the junior teams. Any of those surprising to you? Uh, not really. Um, I think that, especially with guys that uh, are more hyped up like Gradeen, Basha and Parekh. Um, I know some people are disappointed, like wanting them to hold on for the rest of the camp, but uh, I don't think that personally it was necessary because it's like, here, this is what NHL hockey is actually like. Now go kick some butt in the, you know, at the start of your junior camp, you know, and get going for your season and go have fun there. Yeah, and when you talk about chemistry, I mean, you know, there's something to be said about joining your team for opening day. And even if we were to hang on to a guy like Parekh until, you know, let's say the end of training camp or, you know, give him a, well, I guess he's not eligible to play his first, yeah, he'd be eligible to play the first 10. But either way, you know, you're then joining a team in progress. And that's hard for a young guy too. I think that the Flames, and and most teams too, but we'll talk about the Flames here because that's what we're talking about, need to honor that, you know what? These guys aren't going to make our team. Let's send them down and let them be part of their opening day junior team and, you know, be part of that locker room energy and that team culture. Well, and that's where, like, patience and understanding um, is very important for young players' development and setting up them to be able to be in the situation that best serves them to develop. And whether that's, you know, sticking guys that are borderline NHLers that, you know, like if you had to plug in and play right now would be perfectly fine, like Poirier in the AHL for a bit just to get him some game action, you know, that's better for him. And, you know, like treating all of the young players properly is nice to see and not rushing people because, oh, we need this guy, you know, because... We need to sell some jerseys or well, whatever. Well, we talked about last week, the Flames already have more bodies than they have NHL spots for, so there's no reason to rush a guy to the to the NHL no. roster. and that's the important and best way of doing it because, you know, like I don't think anybody in the Sea of Red wants to see the Flames be stuck in the wilderness for the next decade uh, trying to figure out how to actually play NHL hockey. Like, we want these guys to 
be taught the right way and how to properly make the transitions up the ladder as they go instead of well you know you you're a star you know ahl or junior player will just throw you in the nhl right away like they did with sam bennett which you know like curtailed his top end potential instead of being patient with a guy like him you know so like they're doing it more properly this time slow and steady wins the race Yep. You mentioned liking Klapka earlier. Let's go to that. Um, looking at looking at who has who's still on camp and who's looked good so far. Who have you thought really looked good or surprised you so far in camp? Um, well, Klapka is my number one. I, I feel that he's an NHLer now. I don't see I see him making the team. I you know, he brings that right mix of scoring ability plus raw physicality when you're six foot eight you know the even though he's a slender player you know somebody that big is just going to run over people um like he stood up one of the canucks at the blue line in the third period and it looked like he wasn't even trying to hit him that hard and the guy had to stay on the ice for quite a while afterwards because of just how hard that hit was and it, it's one of those things that you know, if you're trying to establish a long-term identity, having guys that are tough to play against and do things the correct way is necessary. And Klapka checks all the boxes, in my opinion. Klapka and Lomberg would be quite an interesting set of wingers for your fourth line. But between them, they are average height. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. One is tall, one is small, but yeah, I mean, just having, you know, the great of both those guys on that fourth line, I think would be, would be quite interesting to see mm -hmm. whether and that's with Rooney in the center or somebody else. I think, uh, yeah, I think you've got to find a way to keep Klapka there. Yeah. Well, and you look at like how championship teams are built and like they have a set identity. Like you, you know what you're getting into when you're playing the Boston Bruins, like, you know, they're always very tough and physical and a pain to play against LA when they were good Florida Panthers last year like you have to fight for every inch of space and having guys like Lomberg like uh Klapka like Pospisil like Kadri all through your lineup like you're gonna have to fight for every inch of space and you might beat us but you're gonna have to earn it not just you know casually walk over us you know and it's one of those things like as the flames get more talented players coming up through the system if we keep that core identity and supplement that with then the flames are going to be one hell of a team to play against yeah i mean you know you mentioned how championships teams are built we're not quite there yet but i get what you're saying and i think that yeah like we're putting in the foundation yeah we're talking like starting from the base part and like building up from there and getting the base correct is the best way of, you know, facilitating the second part. <laughs> if, yeah, for sure. Um, Klapka is still waiver exempt. So that's the only reason I can maybe see him not being on the opening day roster. If he wasn't waiver exempt, I think he'd definitely be here, but there's a guy I think will, I could see him being like Zari or Postle of last year where they weren't on the opening day roster, but they played the majority of their season in Calgary. Yeah. Uh, and I could too. And it, you know, like you might, he might end up just being Peltier. that first call up. Yeah, you might want to keep Peltier because he is waiver eligible and have him in the fourth line spot until injury happens and then clap, bring Klapka up. But, you know, it, it's one of those. Where... I think there's a scenario we can have both as well. I yeah. think we, we talked about this last week and I've been looking at the lineup. If you're willing to put, um, if you're willing to do Jake or I guess, yeah, Jacob Peltier as a centerman. You could have him center that line with Lomberg and Klapka and then move Rooney to be your 13th forward. Yes, and Dryden Hunt can easily switch down to the Wranglers as well. Like that, There are plenty of options one way or the other. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it, it's one of those where... Hunt uh, is not waiver exempt, so that would be a little bit harder. Yeah, but, it, you know, uh, he's kind of one of those guys that you'd see generally on waivers anyway, and... Yeah. Doesn't usually get claimed. No, but I think if they want to keep both, like you and I were trying to figure that out last week of how, you know, who, who fits in and who goes out of lineup. I think if you want to keep both Klapka and Peltier, I think that's the, 
really the only way you could do it. Yep. Rooney has nothing to prove at this point. You know what Rooney is, and I think it's always good to have an extra centerman floating around. But, I agree. But if you're going to keep either Peltier or Klapka, they need to be a regular player. They can't be 13-14. No, they definitely have to be in the lineup, or they should be in the AHL. Yeah. Um, another name I'll say that I really liked was uh, Samuel Hanzig. I think he's really stood out, especially among the guys who really haven't played pro. He's played two pro games. Hanzig has looked mature to me. He's looked like a guy who came in knowing what camp was like and also what kind of player he is. And you often see a lot of these young guys, I think, when they're at their first camp or second camp, and they're not quite sure who they want to be. And they're trying to show off a lot of stuff or kind of, you know, show their cool moves. And and Hanzig looks like a guy who just came in and knows what he wants to show and he's doing it. Do, yeah. do I think he will get NHL time this year? No, I don't. But I think he's going to be a, for anyone who goes, sees the Wranglers play, I think he's going to be a big star on that team. Yeah. He might uh, after the trade deadline, if the flames do move people, but uh, I don't foresee him being up until, you know, unless the, they run into a ton of injuries. I don't see him coming up anytime soon. No. As well, and, and even after the deadline, like there's other guys, I think they'd want to take a look at like, you know, um, Rory Cairns, who's older, uh, Nikolaev, who's older, like, you know, the, both those guys are waiver exempt. I think, you know, Sam Morton, I think they might want to take a look at 25. Like, I think if you're looking at those as evaluative, evaluative yeah, games, um, I agree. You know, there, I think there's other guys. Cole Schwint, I think would probably get the for a call up over Hans Zig at this point. Like, I think there's, there's guys there that you you'd probably see called up first. Yeah, and Hansig, it you know, like initially when the Flames drafted him, I was less enthused about the draft pick itself, um, namely because I wanted uh, Axel uh, Sandin uh, with uh, who was uh, selected by Detroit the pick after us. But you know, the the thing is, is that. Um, it, it took me a while in order to see how he plays the game because it's very different from um, a lot of other young players. Um, it, it, he almost fades into the background too much to the point where you're like, oh, this guy doesn't really do anything. But not understanding, like, on a first glance that, oh, that's by design, so that way, like, he... It plays a very low event hockey. He's very good defensively and, you know, is doing the right things and is in the right places. And, like, now you're seeing that because he's in those right places, he's able to set him himself up by, you know, making the good pass or, you know, deflecting shots in the net or being open. Uh, cause he's just very crafty and like, even though he's six foot four, like he's very sneaky on the ice to get into high danger areas where you don't really notice them until, Oh, too late. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, the other guy that I think has looked good and I think we expect to look good in my opinion is Matt Coronado. Um, looking like a, I'd say coming in, looking like a pro at 21 looked a lot better than I think we saw last year out of camp. I mean, we all liked him, but there was still some rough edges there. And I think a lot of those have been smoothed over. I think at this point though, starting Coronado on your fourth line doesn't make any sense because he's waiver no. exempt. I think just as a victim of numbers, he'll be starting the season wearing a Wrangler's Jersey. Yeah. And I agree. And you know, despite him being basically NHL ready at this point, I think it's better for him to get the 20 minutes a night being the guy in with the Wranglers instead of being put shoehorned in with uh, Rooney and uh, Lomberg. Um, Lomberg, thank you. Yeah. Um, on the fourth line, like it, it's not that's not his game really. Um, like he is more of a dynamic offensive guy. You could put him with Backlund and Coleman, but then you got to take someone out. Yes, exactly. And it, you know, like until like there is room in the top nine, uh, either through injury or whatever, like it, it's better for him to get the reps as being the guy in the A because realistically, when he makes the NHL, you're going to have him in the top yeah. six. And like, like we saw last year, I think he becomes the first call up from the Wranglers, no matter who's out. 
Yes, I agree. You know, and if you look at the top nine, I mean, we've got Sharon Govich, Kadri, Kuzmenko, Coleman, Backlund, Zari, Huberto, Postel, Mantha. You're not taking any of those guys out at this point to to put Coronado in. No. Now, we know that some of those guys probably won't be Flames all year. I mean, I still think that they're bringing in a guy like Mantha for the sole purpose of flipping him. I think Kuzmenko yeah, well, gets signed flipped. a second-round pick. You know. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily have to happen at the deadline. I mean, remember last year we saw the Lindholm deal take place All-Star weekend. So I think that you will see Coronado as a full-time flame at some point. I think as soon as one of those guys gets flipped, he's up. But I think that, you know, at the beginning of the season, he'll be the the star of the Wranglers. Yeah, and you want him to basically between now and the end of the calendar year be the guy in the AHL and you want him to dominate that league so that way okay yeah you're ready let's go and you know you don't have anything left to prove down there you're in the NHL until you prove otherwise at that point and it's much like Wolf last year where it's like okay you're getting a taste of the NHL coming into this year you're in the NHL you know sink or swim and I think with Coronado, it's the same thing. Like once he gets back up here, it's to stay permanently. I agree. And then one more name I'll point out here. You talked about Cooley earlier. He's definitely looked good. We know he's not going to be on an opening day roster just due to numbers. Um, at least not for the Flames. So I think the other name that, and we talked about him last week, is Tyson Berry. And when we saw the split squad game, and even when I've seen him since, like Berry still looks like he's ready to go. And if I look at the Flames defense right now i'd say it's probably Uyghur, Mir, Mirmanov, ball anderson bean pakal and soloviev is kind of their top six i really think barry needs to be in there yeah like realistically bahal needs to be the number seven and like having barry as the number six with soloviev uh down in the farm i think is you know and soloviev for example between him kuznetsov and grushnikov like i think all three of them like, if you needed to put them in the NHL, they would be perfectly fine. But, you know, it, having them get reps in the A as, you know, being the shutdown defensive defenseman that they are will help them as well. Yeah, and uh, the only thing is Soloviev is not waiver eligible, so I could even see him starting the season as six with Bean, with Barry being kind of your your veteran seven, and you, you float Pakal on waivers and hope you don't lose him. And if you do, you do. I mean, we've lost some good players on waivers over the last couple of years. It seems like um, the Coyotes like to take our players off waivers, but, you know. Well, and realistically, like, if you lose a guy like Hanley or Pahal, it, it's a number six, seven guy. It is, yeah. And, and, like, is it disappointing? Yes. But does it, in the long term, like, when you've got guys like Poirier, like uh, Brustevich, uh, and the three defensemen mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, like, you know, we have plenty of other guys who could reasonably do the same thing. Yeah, for sure. You know, like, it's not like, okay, you're going from that to random ahl -er who can't skate. Jared Tenorti. Uh, random ahl -er who can't or skate. Or Jonathan Aspero, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, exactly. So, you know, and it, when we look at this, I mean, you know, Pahal is still young. He's 25, he's in year two of two of his deal, and he's an RFA. I could see a team maybe taking a shot at Pakal, but the thing we have to remember here is that, you know, if you take a shot at these guys, you got to keep if when, and when I say that if you bring them in on waivers, you have to keep them for the whole season, right? If you don't, then they get optioned back to the Flames. I can't see a lot of teams that would be comfortable bringing Pakal in and keeping them in the NHL all year. Well, and realistically, uh, when waiver day happens uh, at the end of training camp, like there are going to be better players yeah. on defense than Plahal. Like, uh, you know, to be blunt. No, it's like, true. There You're are right. Always, like, four as long or five as you wait for that, that big decent. waiver day when everybody gets put in there, he'll yeah. clear. Yeah, because there are four or five guys every year that are better than that, that have more potential of being a top four guy that are placed on waivers for whatever reason that would get claimed ahead of him. So, and like, there are only so many teams needing that six, seven guy. So, you know, yep. it just doesn't make sense. No. And Hanley's 33. He's again, year in year two of a contract. And, you know, I don't see a lot of teams needing a 33 year old Joel Hanley at this point. No. And like, he's your insurance number seven guy, which every team has an insurance number seven guy. So, yeah, it, it's one of those where if you lose them, you lose them. If you don't, kind of irrelevant. 
you know, in terms of the long term of the team. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've talked about pushing young players. I think even for those guys, if you say, look, you guys lost your spot to, a, you know, a walk-on Tyson Berry. Earn it back. We have no allegiance to this guy. You could even see him being, you know, flipped <clears throat> at the deadline. Like, earn it back from Barry. Yeah. Like Mantha, trade deadline, second round pick written all over him. Yeah, like, or even I could see a team who, th- you know, didn't think they're in, in uh, contention coming into contention around Christmas time saying, we got to shore up our D. Let's bring this guy in. I think you'd get him for cheap. Yeah. Well, and that that's the thing. Like, the Flames have options. And, you know, like having a guy like Barry, who is a known quantity, and if you, especially if he bounces back, um in terms of his offensive play you know like that's uh, you know every team needs an offensive defenseman at the deadline like that's always the number one thing that every team's looking for so and even if it i mean in a best case scenario he loses his job tyson berry to one of the other guys and you wave him and lose him you paid nothing to get him you paid you know easy come easy go like i think that would be even if that happened as flames fans if he's getting waved it means other guys are looking good so that's still like oh no we have better players well that's it like you know and if we lose a 33 year old guy on waivers who we paid nothing for i'd be okay with that exactly let's flip just good asset management all the way around regardless exactly yeah and and i look at there is literally no no wrong answer no well i think the wrong answer is not signing barry um, I think you find a spot for Barry with the way that he's looked so far. And even if he's not an everyday NHL or even if he's your, you know, 33 year old number seven or eight, I think that's totally viable as well. Mm-hmm. Let's flip this card around. Let's look at who we haven't thought looked good. And I'll start. Jacob Peltier is the number one name that sticks out to me. I mean, he's going to make the team, I think, because you've got two options, either makes the team or he gets claimed on waivers, but he, he hasn't looked great this year. No, and you can kind of tell that, like, whatever happened to his shoulder is still, like, his shot is, like, non-existent at this point. And he's still hustling, and he's still in the right spots that he needs to be as a forward. It's just that there is no offense of game to him right now. And it's hard when he's struggling to make a shot or a pass at this point. And I, Do you think I don't because know of that we could actually sneak him through waivers. Cause everyone else would see him as damaged goods. Oh, uh, no, I think, uh, because of his, uh, his pedigree first round pedigree and the fact that he looked good before, like he would have made the team out of camp yeah. last year. Uh, Someone if it would wasn't. It. Yeah. But see, that's the thing again is you got to keep him on your NHL roster. Like, is there a team that would bring him in and keep him on the roster? Well, maybe San Jose. Because you can't, you can't bring him in some of the A. Then he gets optioned back here. Like San Jose, and maybe Chicago. Or Anaheim. Maybe Anaheim, yeah. Chicago. Like those are the only teams I could see that might take a chance on him. But I yeah. actually think you might be able to sneak him through because of that. Yeah, I don't think so just because of his pedigree. Like if he was a second round pick, yeah, you could throw him on waivers and he'd be fine. I would be doubtful that he'd get claimed, but... Yeah, I think at this point, I think just him playing the eight minutes a night on the, you know, like he's responsible enough defensively that he can play that zone well enough. And like, if he doesn't turn it around, he'll, he's, you can just wave him during the season. Like if it, he's showing like no pulse at any point, you know, like if you're wanting to bring up a Coronado or a Hansig or a Klapka, you know, at whatever point, you know, but I, I would give him a solid two months in the NHL and like basically until you, you know, you've got till Christmas to show something. And like, if you haven't got there by then, then, you know, move on. Yeah. And again, I can't see him taking a guy out of the top nine to put him in. So I think as much as I don't like the idea of a young player being number 13, I think he either has to play fourth, fourth line center, or he's got to be uh, an alternate forward. Yeah, yeah, like if you put him on the left side as well, like that would be perfectly fine with Rooney in the center. Uh, but but again, then you can't bring uh, Klapkop. Well, no, and that would be this. I think the more likely scenario is having um, Klapka start the year. You know, it it it's tough to it you know. It depends on like what the team feels like they can get away with. 
Uh, but I think like he just needs NHL minutes to ra- figure out his game at the NHL level. And if yep. he can, he can. If he can't, realistically, move on. not necessarily what I want as a fan or what I think is best for the team. I think realistically, Klapka starts in the American League and Peltier starts on the wing on the fourth line and has to, you know, just so you can see what he's got there as a regular NHLer. Yeah. And if Peltier figures it out and, you know, like I think that because of his personality that like the whole team is pushing for him to, you know, because he has very much a good personality that and, you know, an energy with him that you know like uh, i'm sure everybody else is going to be he- trying to help him get better it's just you know he needs to take off at some point and if he doesn't like that's why i'd like to give see him have a runway of like till december january and you know like if you're not you know showing that you're a legit nhl or by then then you know we have other people that we can try instead and yeah, and the guys you know, we talked about, Coronado, Klapka, like we know what we have there, right? We know that, okay, when we bring him up, we, we've we got X or we've got Y out of that player. This is the guy we don't really know what we have, and so I think we need to we need to figure out what we have. And is he still viable? Do we need to cut bait on him? Like I think they need to give him some time. Yeah, and like realistically, if you had to, say, wave him in December and say like he was terrible for the couple of months – uh, you know, no team's going to claim him because, like, they'll look at his track record of, like, 30 games or whatever and go, yeah, I can see why they've cut him. And, yeah. you know, like, not to bother, uh, you know, because it's like if Calgary's cutting you at that point, you're, you know, like, you're not very good. So. Well, and I think that's a nice thing here is with the Flames not being very good, they can give him a try. Like, if we're in a very different scenario, if we're in a playoff contention scenario, I think yeah, you, you we, may have no we would choice throw him on waivers. Waiver. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like if this was three years ago, you he'd be on waivers and you'd have Klapka in his spot. Yeah. Like, no question, in my mind. But, you know, and lose him, be damned. But it's sort of like what happened with Valimaki. Like, he was not the best guy in training camp that year, and he's gone. And, you know, and frankly, we haven't really missed his play, even though he's a full-time NHLer with Utah now. Yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, we don't, we may not know what we're missing, but yeah, I mean, it, it hasn't hurt us all that much. No. And, you know, again, good problem to have having so many guys there. Um, you know, I do think that... I do think there's going to be interesting to see what happens with, with Peltier, but I think you've got to give him a start, but you've got to give him a short leash. Yeah, and, you know, it's proper asset management, too. Like, if you were to throw him on waivers, does he deserve it? Yes. Like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Yes, he deserves to go on waivers right now. But from an asset management point of view, like, you're kind of throwing away potential that might still actually be there. Yeah. You know, and... And first-round picks tend to, for better or for worse, do tend to get a little bit more leverage, I guess, or leeway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it might be them saying to him, okay, guys, you know, like, this is this is what we're going to do, but you're on a short leash and you've got to show us you've earned it. We're starting you in the NHL because you got to start somewhere, but you know, you got to show us that this was the right choice. Don't expect you're there all year just because you started there. I agree. So we'll, we'll see what happens, but yeah, I'm, I think that it's going to be interesting to see what happens with this player. Like, I don't know he's ever going to live up to the same potential again. No. And you know, and especially coming off such a, series of major injuries it does take time to reset and you know if this is all he is he's not an nhl player but you know it might just be that he needs 20 to 30 games to get his feet under him again and you know regain his confidence and be himself again you don't know and coming off of major injuries like this you know, like it, the ideal situation would be for him to start in the AHL and, you know, work his way back up, much like Poirier, but unfortunately he's a year older and not waiver eligible. So, you know, you got to kind of have to learn on the job at, at this point. And I think even if he's an NHLer, we may have to sort of change what we think he's going to be as an NHLer. Like, you know, yeah. he may not end up being a top six guy, he might end up being a, you know, bottom six it's- guy. Yeah, and like if he tops out as being like your third, fourth line energy guy, that's 
useful too. And, you know, it's not the ideal situation, but sometimes that happens. And, you know, like you still need good depth guys too. And, you know, yeah, and, like and, and, uh, literally you know, every roster position matters equally. And yeah. Like if you, and if you, you remember, know, we have a first, first, you know, first round pick in our captain who's really his career has always been as a third line center, still a very valuable part of this team. Oh, yeah. So I could see, you know, I think I'm saying this just to remind fans that just because he might not be in your top six doesn't necessarily mean he's not useful. I mean, Backlund's a great flame, has always been a great flame, still a first round pick, um, and, you know, a guy who found his niche in the bottom six. Yes. Anyone else that's disappointed you? Uh, not overly so. I think everybody's pretty much played at my expectations. Um, and a handful of people exceeding it. But, uh, like, there's no glaring, like, oh, this guy should be ready for the NHL. And it's like, um, what are you doing? No. It's, <laughs> so For me, the only one has been Peltier. And there's other guys where, again, like, okay, you've been surpassed by somebody else, but they're still looking as expected. Yes. So, yeah. And like, there's nobody that's standing out as a, uh, you know, like this guy had potential to be an NHL and is looking like filler depth now. Nobody else like that. So it, everybody seems to be still on the, their road towards being an NHL guy of the young guys. And yep. Or yeah, or not. I mean, I think there's some young guys that we probably know are not going to have a big NHL career and that's okay too. Yes. You know, I guess it depends also what we classify as a young guy. I mean, you know, Aspero's 25. I don't think he's going to go anywhere. I don't know if very Cairns ever will. But, yeah, I think everyone's kind of on trajectory for what we expect them to be. Mm -hmm. So, I guess let's look ahead to the rest of the preseason then. Um, the Flames have a couple games left on the 30th on Truth and Reconciliation Day at 7 p.m. here at the Dome. The Flames play against the Seattle Kraken. Then on Wednesday the 2nd, they will be going to Winnipeg, take on the Winnipeg Jets. That's a 6 p.m. start time. And then Friday the 4th ends their preseason here in Calgary again against the Winnipeg Jets, 7 p.m. start time. Three games left, 40 guys left on the roster. You're pretty much, I think, going to see your NHL roster at this point. Yeah, with maybe like the guys that are pushing like Coronado, um, et cetera, being um, in the lineup as well. Uh, sprinkled through the games, but it's going to be more or less uh, day one lineup, especially the last game of the season. Yeah, preseason. I mean, you might sit, you know, Coleman, you might sit Huberto, you might sit Kadri, some of these big guys that you know who they are to make room for those younger guys. But I think at this point, you are really going to see the Flames play 90% their NHL roster and trying to get, trying to figure out who's going to play with who and starting to try and build those, you know, those opening day rosters. Yep. Um, and you're probably going to see this from their opponents too. Like you'll probably see Seattle and Winnipeg are our next two opponents icing those rosters too. So I think this is where we might start to kind of see how will they stack up against pseudo NHL teams on the other side. I think to me that like, like you said, there's going to be a couple guys sprinkled through, but you're not going to see a ton. I think it's going to be like, you know, who is our fourth line center? Is it Rooney? Is it hunt? Who takes that spot? That sort of thing. Um, but I think this is really just a chance to see your NHL faces and start to see how they work together. And there's still some questions. Like, I still don't know who you play with who on the back end. So I think you'll start to see some of that figured out and tried over the next couple of games. Yeah, exactly. Um, like everything is still kind of in flux. Like, you know, like, uh, Uyghur and Anderson, where they're going to be in the lineup and uh, on the back end and everybody else is kind of fungible and, up front, uh, you know, I honestly, I don't even see any of the lines other than Backlund, Coleman, and whomever being, you know, like generally like those guys, like Sharon Govich and Kuzmenko, I expect them to be together. Beyond that, it, you know, everybody else kind of can just. Yeah, I think I think wherever. you've got Sharon Govich, Kuzmenko. I think you've got Hubert Mantha, and you got Backlund, Coleman, kind of as the pairs to make your first three lines around. Yeah, and then. And then, you've, and then you've got to where. fit Kadri, Pospisil, and Zari somewhere in that top six. Yeah. 
And, you know, I, I guess when I look at the Flames roster, the only thing I worry a little bit about is center depth. Like, we've got Kadri as, I would say, the number one center. We've got Backlund as two or three. You've got Postel and Zari, neither guy who's shown that they're a center at this point. you got a whole bunch yeah, of wingers. Sharon Govich, who can play center, but is not really a center. No, and, and I think you want to start and, him as a winger. Well, and, it, like, as much as, like, the Flames needed a center or a defenseman last year and went out and got, like, 18 defensemen, it felt like, uh, to stock up the cupboards, like, the next glaring weakness that this organization has is a lack of center depth. Like, when you're only two legit NHL centers are, like, 34 years old, you, you need centers coming Yeah, I mean, the all the guys we talked about, Klapka's a winger, um... Coronado's a winger. Maybe Pelty, I think, has played some center, but I don't but think... But he's primarily a winger. He's primarily a winger. When we look at some of the other young guys, Stromgren's a winger. Hanzig is a wing center, but he's a couple years away. Parker Bell's a winger. I guess Clark and, Bishop and Justin Kirkland are your centers, but they're not making the team. Yeah. Rory like, Cairns is a center, but he's not making the team. Yeah. like, And you can shoehorn guys like Zari, like Pospisil, like Sharon Govich in as a, well... Somebody yeah. needs to be there, but you know, like that's also not a recipe for no. success long term. I guess the next, I guess the next center up is uh, Schwint. If I'm looking at the sort of the depth chart, but yeah, you still need a second line center, and I think Zari or Pospisil is going to end up playing that role. Yeah, like I can basically all but guarantee you, first round pick by the Calgary Flames this year will be a center, regardless of where the Flames are picking. Um, and you know, probably their second first round pick if they have one and, 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 and unless like, like you said, I mean, they, they trade Kuzmenko for a center, they trade Mantha for a center. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, or like if they d decide to move Anderson near the deadline at, for a haul, like, you know, the number one asset coming back is going to be a center. Yeah. You, know, you can only that, upgrade that kind of one thing. position at a time. Yeah. Like that, you know, everything else organizationally the flames are kind of good and like we have enough wingers where we're organizationally good like we can always draft more but you know we're fine defense we're more than fine goaltending we're fine you know just centers are is the black hole right now so you know it, up until we get two or three top notch young guys coming up up the middle like which thankfully those tend to be the easiest guys to draft because it's like oh well you know it's sort of like the Monahan draft where well well duh <laughs> it's easy to draft a center it's hard to find an elite center yes and right now I don't think that's necessarily what they need to find they just got to bring in some centers and mm -hmm. I think also I mean you can draft some but I think like they did with defense you're gonna have to trade at some point for an NHL ready center yeah and realistically you know like their first round pick assuming it's like top eight because mm -hmm. uh, it should be yeah um but it's like Parekh, that player will be a couple years away yeah i think i i think kuzmenko or mantha whoever's first out gets flipped for a center that's possible or or, or more draft picks because that yeah like, i mean and just... we saw that last year we got both right we got picks and and prospects Yes, and I think that like the Flames are going to just need to use as many assets in the upcoming drafts, you know, plural, on centers until you know, like they have a replacement for Backlund, a replacement for Kadri, centers and goals, and another. Yes, exactly. So we'll see how the last couple of games go here. The last three games, I think you will be seeing some fights for position, like we talked about. We didn't talk about guys today, like Dryden Hunt, who I still think could be in that fight. I think Cole Schwint could be in that fight. So it'll be interesting to see who makes a team and who doesn't, or if the Flames get forced to make a move to, you know, allow a body on the team. And that's something we haven't really discussed. And I don't think, you know, we'll we'll see if that happens before we sit and and blue sky what that might look like. But there is still some some spots to be taken. Yeah, like you could always see a guy like Rooney, say, getting flipped for like a seventh round pick or something like that, or future considerations or, you know, miscellaneous prospect here if, you know, they needed to make room. But yeah, you know. I, I think Ro I don't think you trade Rooney at that point. I mean, I think Rooney no. has a valuable position as a 13. I think if there's, you know, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't flip him. It, there's other bodies we could flip if we're looking for a seventh. Yeah, I agree. 
Two other things I want to let everyone know before we sign off for this week. One is that the Flames are debuting. We're seeing all these hockey TV shows. The Montreal Canadiens have one coming out and stuff like that. The Flames are doing their own now called The Chase. And it's an inside look at training camp. It's a series that they're producing. They'll be free on their website, so you don't have any streaming platform. But starting this Tuesday, October 1st, The Chase will be debuting on CalgaryFlames.com. Check that out. It looks like it'll be pretty cool, an inside look at training camp. And then the last thing I want to mention is just tell everyone to save a date for us. November 3rd is the Battle of Alberta. That's a Sunday night, 6 p.m. Matt and I are going to be back with our friends at Bow River Brewing that night doing a Battle of Alberta trivia night. We'll have some more details next week, but I just want to let everyone know, save that date, make uh, plans to come down to Bow River Brewing and play Battle of Alberta trivia with Matt and I. We're going to have some cool prizes, and it's always a great time. You can, If anyone's been down there with us the last couple of events, it's always a lot of fun down there. So we hope to see you. We'll have more details, but put it in your calendar now so that you make sure you're going to be there. Anything else you want to chat about, Matt? Uh, not really. I think uh, we got everything fairly covered, and it's just it'll be interesting to see how the next week shapes out for the team and, you know, they waiting eagerly to talk about the start of the season with our next episode next time you and i chat the season will be ready to get started actually the nhl season will technically be underway but the flames won't have played yet yeah because there are overseas games and such that there's will overseas start. games starting the season while teams are still playing exhibition games yes because that makes sense anyhow um yeah and as always go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.